Hello, my name is Ray Hughes and I'm an interviewer for the Veterans History Project operated out of Washington, D.C. at the National Archives and conducted locally at the Cincinnati Hamilton County Public Library and administered by Brian Powers, who is our cameraman today. And today is the 29th of March, 2017, and we have the honor and privilege of interviewing William Scott Fee, a veteran of the Vietnam War. And is it all right to call you? Uh, Please call me Bill. Bill, well, it's a pleasure to meet you. Nice meeting Bill. you, Ray. Good Thank you for you. having me here. Yes, sir. Um, Bill, if you would, we just start out with the basics, like uh, where were you born and when? And I was born right here in Cincinnati in 1947. I was born and raised here. Went to, uh, grew up in Kennedy Heights and Silverton. Attended Walnut Hills High School for six years. Went to the University of Cincinnati. Um, so I'm a native Cincinnatian. And um, other outside of the two years in the Army and seven years living in Memphis, so my wife and I have lived our whole lives here in Cincinnati. And what were your parents' names, Bill? Uh, I was born to Robert and Burtis Fee. My father uh, moved here to Cincinnati in the 1930s from Muncie. My mother moved here with him in the 1930s and um, they lived their whole lives here until they died. What did your father do for a living? My father was a sign painter, uh, the lost art of painting signs with the hand, right. and he owned his own little company, the Fee Sign Company. Uh, if there was a painted sign anywhere in the city, it came from the Fee Sign Company. And what was your mother's maiden name, Bill? My mother was born Burtis Bell Carter in Rucheville, Indiana, raised uh, by parents who were Quakers. And uh, both my mom and dad uh, went to Earlham College and um, moved here and um, uh, had two sons. I have an older brother who's still alive. He's seven years older than I am. Uh, I'll turn 70 this year. I see. And what's your birthday, the day of July 19th, 1947. I see. Um, so you uh, attended, you were at the University of Cincinnati? I graduated from high school in 1965 and started attending uh, UC in, uh, in the fall of 1965. I see. And what were your, your major, or going um, to be your major? When I first uh, enrolled at UC, I was a, a business major. I had no idea what I wanted to do. And um, about a year, year and a half later, I really was unhappy with, with um, being in college. And that corresponded with my leaving to uh, enlist in the Army. Uh, had you met your uh, to-be wife yet at this point in your life? I had. Uh, I um, left college in December of 1966 and, and enlisted in the January of 1967, and I had met my wife in 1966. And uh, we were dating. Uh, it was uh, an informal relationship, but we would call each other uh, boyfriend and girlfriend. And um, which was strange because I met her right before I enlisted to go to Vietnam, and um, she stood by me. And we're, this will we'll celebrate our 45th wedding, 48th wedding anniversary this year. And your wife's name? My wife's name is Sally. And she grew up Sally Isferding, and uh, she was born and raised in Cincinnati as well. Went to Marymount High School. Um, didn't know her in high school. We met in college. I was in, S in the SAE fraternity. She was in the Theta sorority. And they're right next to each other on Clifton Avenue at the uh, university, and that's how we met each other. I see. And what was she majoring at? She's a nurse. a nurse. So she was in a four-year nursing program and um, was a nurse her whole life until she retired about four years ago. I see. Um, you said you joined the military. Uh, what, what, what behooved you to join? And obviously you weren't drafted, uh, and you're a college student. And this there's a terrible war going on. Yes, um, as I said earlier, I was uh, not enamored with being in college and I was just preoccupied with the war in Vietnam. It was still very early in 1966. Uh, there were very few protests against the war at that point. And so uh, the war had not really achieved the level of, of prominence that it did starting in 66 and 67 and 68. And all my college friends were just oblivious to what was happening in Vietnam. I didn't know anybody who was serving in the Army, but I was 
very upset that nobody paid attention to what was going on and that a lot of young men and women were, were uh, sacrificing a lot. And I just decided I wanted to be there. I, I will say that it wasn't all due to patriotism. I mean, I had a sense of adventure in my heart and I was only 19 years old and it was just, I just felt compelled that I wanted to be there. So I left college and enlisted. I made it very easy for the recruiter. Uh, I remember the office was in Norwood when I went there to enlist, and I told him I want to enlist, I wanted to be in the infantry, and I wanted to go to Vietnam. So I was an easy, I was an easy case for him. And six months later, I was, I was there. What was the date you enlisted? January 7th, 1967. Did my basic training at Fort, uh, Fort Knox in Kentucky, did my advanced infantry training, in Fort Polk, Louisiana, then had additional infantry training in Fort Lewis, Washington, and headed out for Vietnam uh, in June of 1967. The, uh, if you would, go through some of your training, what, what you, uh, how they trained you at Polk and, and at Fort Lewis. Well, it's very interesting. When you graduate from basic training and go to advanced infantry training at Fort Polk, the, uh, the drill sergeants and the trainers usually, usually say, forget everything you learned at, in basic training. We're going to start over with you because we, we trained at, and in basic training. We, we trained with the old M4, uh, M14s. We got the advanced infantry training and we trained with the M16s, which was a new rifle, fairly new rifle at the time, and it was the standard issue for the infantrymen in Vietnam. So we had to learn to fire a, a, a brand new weapon. We got to Fort Lewis after advanced, advanced infantry training, and they basically said, don't forget everything about AIT, but uh, you're going to have to learn what it's like to be in Vietnam. We were there for four weeks and had special training from um, uh, NCOs who had just returned from the country. And I was in a situation that was very different from most other Vietnam vets. Um, when you enlisted or when you were drafted, Usually you went to Vietnam by yourself and you went to various units that needed replacements. Either somebody who was killed, who was rotating out, or somebody who was wounded. In, the, in 1967, the 1st Infantry Division uh, had three companies, uh, three infantry companies in each battalion, about 300 men. In 1967, as the war was starting to build up, the 1st the Infantry decided to add a Delta Company to all their battalions to increase their the battalion strength of four companies, or um, about 1,200, about 1,000 men is what it was. Um, I'm sorry, about 400 men, 100 men per company. So the, in this, this uh, gearing up of the 1st Infantry Division battalions, uh, I trained in basic and advanced and at Lewis with the young men that I was going to fight with in Vietnam. And that was a very new experience for the infantry. Yeah, right. So we trained together for almost six months, and we all went to Vietnam together on a ship, the USNS Geiger, a troop carry ship. It took three weeks to get to Vietnam, and uh, we were infantrymen, not sailors, and we were very happy to see Vietnam when we got off that boat. And uh, the advantage we had, there was an advantage and a disadvantage. The disadvantage was we were going into combat, uh, combat as a green unit where some of our NCOs had been in country for a while, but all of us infantrymen were brand new. We were green and untested. The advantage we had, and it was a, it, it far outweighed the disadvantage, was the fact that we knew each other already for six months when we went into combat. We were very close as a unit. Uh, we depended upon each other, um, and we knew who was next to us in the foxhole when we finally got into combat, and that was very reassuring for us. So. Um, all of Company D you were familiar with and knew on an intimate basis? Most of the men, and you, it's hard to know a hundred men very well. Uh, on a platoon basis, we, we were just like brothers. Uh, I, I would know uh, most of the men in my platoon. Um, to the point where even now, f this was 50 years ago when I went to Vietnam in 1967. To this date, I'm still very close with uh, some of my fellow soldiers. We have had a uh, Delta Company a 20th reunion, a 30th reunion, a 40th reunion, and a 45th reunion. And that's very unusual for Vietnam veterans. 
what about the NCOs in your outfit and the uh, and Company D and uh, and I guess officers, uh, first lieutenant. Most of the NCOs who were squad leaders at that point, they were uh, either uh, E5s or E6s, had been in country. Uh, and the NCOs uh, really are the leaders of an infantry unit. Uh, the lieutenants, uh, most of them were right out of OCS. They were very inexperienced. And in combat, your second lieutenants will heavily depend upon their, their uh, staff sergeants and the other NCOs for guidance when you're on patrol. Um, and in terms of the uh, battalion commanders, company commanders and battalion commanders, it was a mix between uh, new officers and officers with experience. We were very fortunate to have as a battalion commander Lieutenant Colonel Richard Cavazos. Um, he, had been in, he had fought in Korea and he had been in Vietnam and uh, he got to Vietnam before Delta Company arrived, and um, he was a remarkable, and still is a remarkable gentleman. He's 88 years old today, and we've had very close contact with our battalion commander, which is another, another difference in the experience that we had in Delta Company than most other infantry soldiers. Uh, Lieutenant Colonel Cavazos was very intimate with the soldiers. He'd walk through the foxholes. Um, as I described in the book, he fought right alongside of us. Most battalion commanders uh, lead a battle either from the headquarters back at the perimeter, away from the fighting, or in a helicopter above where they can see what's going on and direct the fight from above. Lieutenant Colonel Cavazos fought right with us on the ground. Wow. So you arrived in Vietnam in what, June of 1967? Well, we left in June of 67. Okay. We arrived in July. In July. I had my 20th birthday on the, on the ship going over. We arrived about the third week in July. Our base camp was Zeon. It's spelled D-I-A-N, but in Vietnamese it's pronounced Zeon, which was about uh, 50 miles north of uh, Saigon in the Third Corps area. And the field of operations for the 1st Infantry for our battalion was between Saigon and the Cambodian border, uh, just a few miles north. Northwest of Saigon? Northwest of Saigon, mm -hmm. yes, sir. And so you were at Xi'an, and what are your duties at Xi'an? Well, we got there in July expecting that we were going to, Delta Company was at Xi'an. The other three companies in our battalion, uh, A, B, and C companies, were out there uh, in combat. And we thought we were going to join them right away. And we were highly disappointed to hear that we were going to have another six weeks of training at Xeon. And basically they said, they told us at Xeon, forget everything you learned in the States. Now we're going to, now you're in country, you're going to have to learn uh, before, we, before we take you into combat. And the primary reason was uh, the officers that were there were in country, they knew what the experience was like. And the 1st Infantry Division dug a different kind of foxhole than any other uh, army division. Um, foxholes, are, it, foxholes are the homes for the infantry soldier in Vietnam and so it's very important that you build a good fortified fox, foxhole and the first division built one that had a roof on it and two rifle pits. It wasn't just a hole where we looked out. It, was a, it took a lot of training to learn how to build those foxholes and they were lifesavers once we got into combat. How deep is the foxhole? Foxhole is probably about uh, five feet deep. The only thing you really want to see outside the foxhole basically is your head. There are steps. We built steps with, with shovels that went down into the ground. And then we put sandbags around the fo foxhole all the way around, but there were two rifle pits on the left and right uh, that through which we would fire. And then we put metal bars, rebar bars, across the top and put sandbags on the top. So. We were totally covered for rifle fire and uh, grenades and mortars, except for the two rifle pits. And they went out like an appendage this way? Yes. And when we went out and when the company would set up, Delta Company would set up, the pits would cover a fire zone where the foxhole next to ours on the right would just overlap the fire zone. So theoretically, you're looking through a port and with all the foxholes coordinated together, you have a totally covered fire zone. Um, the terrain prevented 
efficiency at that because sometimes there would be trees or bushes or anthills that we, we couldn't really cover. But that was the way the, the 1st Battalion, 18th Regiment of the, of the Big Red One built their foxholes. How many men are in a foxhole? Usually three to four. Um, there are, at full strength, you have 10 men in a squad. You have four squads in a platoon. So your platoon is, then you usually have a mortar squad also with your platoon. So there were between 40 and 50 men in a platoon. But that's at full strength, and we were never at full strength. Um, so we had three men in a foxhole. Sometimes during combat, when things get a little crazy, somebody else would jump in the foxhole with you, and there would be four or five people. I see. Um, we'll continue then. Um, the behind the foxhole, we'd build another small wall of about th three feet high of sandbags, and that would be the sleeping area. So you'd have a foxhole with, covered with sandbags, and then you have a, an area of about, oh, six feet by eight feet behind the foxhole, fortified with sandbags, nothing on the top, just the walls. And that's when, when one soldier is on duty in the foxhole, guard duty, the other two or three soldiers would sleep behind the foxhole. And I slept and fought with a very core group of men, young men, um, who to this day, those that are still alive, are very good friends of mine and whom uh, I see frequently. I, know, I, uh, I heard you discuss the ants and, and things. Uh, could you go into some detail what you meant by that? Viet this is one thing that you don't learn in training. You, 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 the Vietnam terrain is so different. Um, in the north you have mountains, in the south you have, uh, in the delta you have swamps. In the third core area between Saigon and the Cambodian border, uh, the terrain was um, just it like was looked like Georgia, just red Georgia mud, very hard, very clay, um, and just beautiful lush valleys, uh, a lot of rice paddies, uh, no serious mountains. But when we went into the field and set up, uh, we were in probably four or five different places before I was wounded and airlifted out. The terrain would differ, but um, in one location, which was our first uh, combat, uh, combat operation in October of 67, we were, we were uh, encamped in among uh, some anthills. And there's nothing you can do about it when, when, the, when the colonel decides to put your platoon there, you have to make do. And uh, these were very big red ants, very mean. And they came out at night. And we'd be in the foxhole, or we'd be, be, try to sleep behind the foxhole. And these ants would swarm all over us and just bite. They were vicious ants. It was very uncomfortable. Just one of the, the hazards of being in the wrong place at the wrong time. Any other uh, type of uh, animals or insects that would uh, um, yes, particularly the leech. Uh, leeches were prominent in the rivers and streams uh, of Vietnam. And when we patrolled during the day, we, we, we'd inevitably be walking through several rivers. Uh, sometimes they got up to chest deep high where we'd have to hold our rifles above us to cross. And uh, the leeches would get inside your uniform somehow. Uh, they always did. And they were they weren't not life-threatening, but they were, they were big, to the point that in this area, if we had crossed through water, when we got back to the base camp, we would always strip and buddies would check each other for leeches. Um, I had leeches on me several times after several patrols, and the only way to get them off is to take a cigarette and uh, burn the leech, and, and the leech would come off after the cigarette. The mosquito repellent would also, uh, was very, potent mosquito repellent. You spray some of that on the skin and the leech would come off as that as well. What did you do to protect yourself about the ants, the red ants? There's nothing you could do. We had plenty of mosquito repellent. Came in a little white plastic bottle about this size. Uh, most of us would stick it in our pocket or we'd stick it in our headband. We had a band that went around our helmet and stick it there. And we always had to coat ourselves to make sure. And that kept the mosquitoes away. It wouldn't keep the ants away. The other hazard was mosquitoes, because malaria was still uh, uh, prevalent for the infantrymen in Vietnam uh, through drinking 
unpurified water. Uh, part of our army issue was a big orange pill, about the size of a nickel, or the size of a dime, let me say. And it was big and it was orange, and that was our anti-malaria pill. And uh, we would take that pill uh, frequently. I can't recall if it was a daily or several times a week. Uh, to guard against mosquito bites. We got mosquito bites all the time. You can't avoid mosquito bites. Mm -hmm. uh, and if you either did not take your pill or you drank some unpurified water out of the stream, you could um, get malaria, a serious case. And several of the soldiers had to be removed from the field when they got malaria. What did you do about purifying water? If you the Army has an answer to everything. And the Army also had purification water tablets. I'm sure if you've interviewed other Vietnam veterans, they will tell you about the, t the tablets. Um, you get some water from the stream. This is when you're out in the field. And you would put that purification tablet in there and let it dissolve and shake it up. Uh, the theory was that would, that would prevent you from getting dysentery or malaria. And it, it did for the most part. Um, I never had malaria or dysentery, but I did get a case of jungle rot, which was uh, uh, when your skin stays moist all the time, it, your, your skin it just develops uh, some warts and, they, and the skin breaks and gets infected. And I had to be sent back for about three or four days to let that heal. Um, that's why it was so important to always have dry socks. The most important thing that an infantryman needed in Vietnam was an extra pair of dry socks. Uh, we'd get back from patrols, your, your bottom half from the knee down would just be totally soaked from either water or mud. And we had to make sure that we kept our feet dry and we were able to put a clean pair of, of dry socks on our feet after they dried off. What about the boots you wore? The boots were the standard issue Vietnam boots, uh, rather than all leather boots. Uh, I'm sure you've seen the boots that had a netting on either side. And uh, that was to let the water in and let the water out and let air in uh, to help aerate the, the foot. And it was, a, it was a very well designed boot. It truly was. It was really made for Vietnam. Okay. Um, I asked that question and then I lost my train of thought. Um, Oh, what did the water taste like after you put the purification tablet in it? I mean, I, for the sake of this interview, I won't tell you exactly how it tasted like. I mean, yeah. But um, uh, it did not taste good. None of the water tasted good, and it was always warm. Um, I was dating my future wife, Sally, at the time, and her mother um, uh, sent me from time to time a little care package. Uh, we wouldn't get our mail regularly, but when the care package arrived to us in the field, she always sent me uh, a, about a dozen Kool-Aid packets. So we'd take the Kool-Aid and f empty it into the, w into the canteen and shake it up. And so the water was warm, but at least it tasted like something. Right. And the Kool-Aid Kool and chewing gum was, were the two best things that an infantryman could have from home. And dry socks as well. Of course. <laughs> um, so we're now... What month are we in? Um, well, I arrived in July. We had training until the end of August. And about the second week in September, uh, Delta Company joined the rest of the battalion. Uh, we were never at full battalion strength in the field. Uh, one company of men was always in the rear for rest and recuperation when we went into combat. So. When we were in combat, we had three out of four companies in our battalion. We rejoined the battalion in September and um, visited a couple places that were not combat zones. I mean, every square mile was theoretically a combat zone, but we were airlifted into fairly safe areas just to do patrolling and get the feel of the land and being uh, out in the field with no hot meals, having to dig a foxhole every three or four days endless patrols and we did that for the month of September and in October we had our first combat experience uh, the, the, the um, several first infantry division battalions were hit and so the colonel lifted uh, our battalion the first of the 18th into the combat area and it was called uh, Operation Shenandoah and we were out there for about two weeks in combat and that was our first taste of combat.
and um, if you wish, I'll go into some detail about that. Um, well, what, what we were lifted into a in a, into the war zone we, by helicopter. By helicopter, um, the helicopters would never land on the ground. We had to jump out of them when they were about six feet off the ground. Um, we formed up and uh, did a patrol and uh, got to an area where uh, we were going to be fortified. And there were several first infantry to bat battalions in the area, so the first of the 18th um, made camp. It was our first time in a combat zone, a hot zone as we called it, and the, it was raining mercilessly, absolutely mercilessly. The summer and the fall months in Vietnam are the rainy season, where it rains every day. When, it, when you get to November, December, the dry season begins. But we set up our first camp. We didn't get to the um, camp until four, four o'clock in the afternoon. And so we were digging our foxholes and setting up our perimeter and uh, in a, at the Delta Company, there would be 100 men, and the foxholes would be in a circle with the colonel's headquarters in the middle. And we dug foxholes all night long in the pouring rain. Um, the foxholes filled up with water immediately, uh, so, so it was not really a, a, a perfect foxhole. But fortunately, we didn't get hit that night. We got hit the next day when we went on patrol. And uh, we were in an area. Um, I don't even know what the area was, uh, but, or what the name of the area was. But we, we went on patrol and got hit almost every day. We knew we were up against the Viet Cong unit, a regimented Viet Cong unit, not the NVA. Uh, you have to understand that the 1st Infantry was working in an area of north of Saigon up to the Cambodian border, and that's where the Ho Chi Minh Trail came into South Vietnam. And in, we were there in 1967, and the North was really gearing up for a major fight, as you know, which resulted in the Tet Offensive about four months later. But uh, we were there, and we were told we were up against the um, uh, a, a regimented Viet Cong unit, which means they, they were Viet Cong, they were South Vietnamese, but they were uniformed, uh, they were organized. And um, we got hit almost every day. Uh, they attacked our perimeter one night and were repelled, um, but that was our first taste of com combat. And it actually uh, tasted pretty good uh, for our first time, because as I said, we were all very close at that point. We were very proud that Delta Company's first uh, encounter with the enemy was a successful one. I. Uh I read in your memoir about uh, rubber trees. Are you in this area now? Or? We were not in the rubber trees uh, in October, Okay. Uh, in early October. Um, following the, the first part of the Shenandoah campaign, as it was called, um, after we were in, in there about 10 days, they pulled us out, gave us a rest uh, at Phuc Vinh and, uh, for about two weeks and where we had hot meals and showers. I mean, we were, it was just like being in heaven after being out in the boonies for a couple of weeks. And uh, about two weeks later, they got a call that we were, being, we were rejoining the battalion again. And this was the last week in October. And uh, we were uh, airlifted into another hot LZ uh, outside the village of uh, Lak Ninh. Lak Ninh is right on the Cambodian border, so we were even further north, and this is the, the area where all the rubber tree plantations are. And I will tell you that the rubber trees, uh, the plantations are very, very um, interesting uh, operations. Beautiful, beautifully straight rows of trees, uh, and every other row of tree has a drainage ditch. Uh, where the, it captures the water during the rainy season and irrigates the trees. And these r trees would just go for miles. Um, and we set up uh, outside Loch Ninh, right in the middle of a rubber tree uh, plantation. Uh, it was fairly flat, some rolling hills, and um, unlike Shenandoah, uh, at Loch Ninh we got hit as soon as we uh, started digging our foxholes. And uh, it was apparent from our first firefight there that we were up against the North Vietnamese in this case. 
Um, there was the 165th North Vietnamese uh, Army. Um, yeah. Um, unlike um, Shenandoah, we were up against the North Vietnamese Army, and um, I think I may, misspoke earlier. We were up against the 65th North Vietnamese Army at Lac Ninh. In Shenandoah, it was the 173rd Viet, Viet Cong Regiment. So we were hit as soon as we started setting up our foxholes, and the colonel sent out um, um, Bravo Company to go out uh, and rescue uh, an am uh, a squad that was ambushed. And on that very first day, before we had even dug in, two of the uh, soldiers in, in Bravo Company were, were killed. And we, we, we watched as they came back to the, after the enemy fled, we watched as they brought the bodies back. And that was the first time that I had seen a dead American soldier. And that was um, very uh, upsetting to me. So we knew that unlike Shenandoah, that we were, we were up against a, a hardcore force. We dug in, we had no other problems. Uh, we um, did a couple of days of patrols the next two days, didn't run into anything. So we got to locking in thinking, well, maybe it's not gonna be as bad as we thought it was. Uh, then uh, the evening of November 1st occurred. And um, after two days of, uh, of of, of patrols that were that were where nothing happened, um, we just thought we were just going to probably be here at Loch Ninn and maybe move out after a couple of days. Uh, on the night of November first, uh, the enemy attacked about midnight. Um, mortars started falling all around the perimeter, and again we're in the we're in right in the rubber tree plantation, and so when the explosions occurred, the flash would fly up and the trees above us would provide a cover, so the whole perimeter was just lit up with, with explosions going on all over the uh, perimeter. We all dug into, uh, dove into our holes, and about a half an hour later, the uh, NVA attacked on the other side of the perimeter, on Alpha Company's side. On this, on this patrol, uh, the three companies there um, were Bravo, Alpha, and Delta Company. And um, the enemy attacked on the other side. And there was nothing we could do. The enemy always tries to probe one point of the perimeter to find a weak point. They, had, they fought for about 15 minutes and pulled back. And so we used that as a short time just to get ready. We stacked up all of our magazines right next to us. We just got ready looking out into the dark. Um, another tactic that the 1st Division did very well was when we set up our perimeters, we put out Claymore mines and trip flares. Uh, the Claymore mines were uh, detonated mines that had a, a wire that came to the foxhole. You put out the Claymore mine and you could trigger it uh, when you see the enemy approaching. The trip flares are put out. They're just basically flares, but they're put out and they are hooked up to a wire that we would put between two trees to catch the enemy coming in. And these would be about 50 meters out to our front. Um, another tactic of the 1st Division uh, in combat is to put a listening post about uh, 50 to 75 meters in front of the foxholes. Um, about every uh, platoon had a listening post. Two men who would sit there and serve to, to hear the enemy come in. And uh, about midnight, um, or about an hour and a half after the initial uh, contact with the enemy earlier, the two people from the, our listening post um, came in and they knew where the trip flares were so they, they wouldn't trigger anything coming in. And one of them was supposed to be in a different foxhole. His name was Steve Deal. He jumped in the foxhole with Mike Silliberti, Frank Fierro, and me. So there were four of us in the foxhole and he was saying, they're coming in. And this was about two o'clock in the morning. And shortly thereafter, all the trip flares, all in front of Delta Company, they had been on the other side of the perimeter about two hours earlier, they decided to attack our side. And before the trip flares went off, we could hear him approaching our perimeter, which was very, very disconcerting to us. Uh, the officers had whistles. And we could hear whistles blowing. We could hear shouts being given. We could hear the trees or the sticks and the leaves rustling. And they weren't running, they were just walking toward us. 
And we heard this before the first trip flare went off. And of course, once the trip flare went off, we started detonating the claymores, throwing our grenades. Um, we knew the battle, the second phase of the battle was going to be in front of us. And they came in full force, and we could see, we could see their uniforms, their, their pith helmets, uh, um, their, um, their faces, and we were in the midst of, of combat, and then I, I got wounded that night in that battle. How did you get wounded? The, um, the, uh, the North Vietnamese and the, uh, and the organized Viet Cong had uh, a wonderful Chinese weapon called the RPG rocket, rocket-propelled grenade. It's still used today, unfortunately, over in the Middle East. Um, it's a shoulder-fired weapon. It's a grenade, but it's, it's a, a shoulder-fired grenade. Um, that is designed to penetrate armor, so it's a good anti-armor um, weapon, but it also has a huge concussion amount, so it, it could dismantle and destroy a foxhole full of sandbags. It would just obliterate it. And about three, this would be about between three and 3.30 in the morning uh, when they attacked, uh, an RPG rocket exploded right on the other side of the sandbags from my, from my position. There were four of us in, in a row in our foxhole. And this time, other than firing through the ports, we felt that the, the, the attack was so heavy that we were sitting behind the foxhole, firing over the top of our foxhole. We, we just didn't feel comfortable firing through the ports. And so we were firing, and um, an RPG exploded right next to me. And I was on the far right, so I caught all the blast. But I'm here talking to you this morning only for one reason. And that reason was because uh, I had my helmet on and I was in a kneeling position behind a three foot row uh, wall of sandbags and I was using my rifle sight. I had an M16 and the enemy was there. It was well lit from flares and so I could see the enemy that I was shooting at and I was looking through my rifle sight, and when the RPG hit, the only exposed part of my body was my right shoulder. Um, had I not had my helmet on, or had I not been looking through my rifle sight, I, the whole side of my head would have been destroyed. And so I was very fortunate. It destroyed my right shoulder, and um, that was the end of my combat experience. That was the night I was wounded, and uh, as I described in the book, um, uh, the medic, Frank Passantino, put me together as best he could and dragged me behind the foxhole, gave me his 45 caliber pistol and said, I got to treat other wounded. You keep this. You need this more than I do because this was in the middle of the fight and we didn't know how serious it was going to be at this point. I could see Deal, Silberti, and Fierro out in the front still fighting and uh, Fierro was the grenade launcher. Uh, I'm sorry, Silberti, you was the soldier who carried the M79 grenade. We had our own grenade launcher. It, was, it looked like a sawed-off shotgun, mm -hmm. but you'd put a grenade in there and you'd aim it and just pop it. Uh, he ran out of ammo, and uh, so he picked up my M16 and used it when I was laying in the back of the foxhole. I laid there for I don't know how long, probably about a half an hour. By this time, it was 4 o'clock in the morning, and Passantino came to get me, the medic, and said, you're getting out of here, Fee. And I said, no way. The battle's still going on. It's dark. He said, the colonel got you a helicopter. And what had happened is Passantino and my staff sergeant, Sergeant Page, sort of carried me over. I was staggering, but they each had an arm around me and carried me over to the, to the clearing in, in, the, in the perimeter where the helicopters would land. It was not a medevac helicopter. The medevac, the first first Red Cross helicopters, the medevac helicopters, did not have to fly at night, nor did they have to fly in it in a combat situation. But as it turned out, the 1st of the 18th Battalion was so low on ammunition that the colonel ordered more ammunition to be brought in. And uh, there were brave enough helicopter pilots that flew a couple of choppers in to bring in ammo, and as soon as the choppers were empty, the colonel loaded the wounded on the helicopters, and, which included me and um, airlifted me out of the battle at 4 o'clock in the morning. 
Who was airlifted with you? Uh, there was only one other wounded soldier on my chopper. His name was Willie Carson. He was two foxholes over to my left, and he was seriously wounded with a machine gun blast uh, in his in his belly. And so he was on he was on the floor, and there were uh, two medics on the chopper. And I I didn't have any plasma. I just had a bunch of patches on my shoulder, but uh, Carson had plasma or blood or whatever. And I, I remember the medic was just holding it as we were being airlifted out. And um, as we were going out, we could see the tracers. They were trying to shoot the choppers down. Um, the, uh, the infantryman's tracer, our tracers, were red. Every fifth bullet has a little bit of phosphorus on it. So when it, tr when it shoots, you can sort of gauge where you're shooting. The, the enemy tr had tracer bullets, too but their colors were green or white. And so in a battle, the outgoing tracers would be red, the incoming tracers would be green and white. And you can't explain the terror or the, 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 the fright that you have when you see these bullets coming at you, but that's, it's not like what you see in movies today or any movie, um, you know, because the movie's being filmed with um, blank bullets. Uh, these are live bullets, and you could hear them popping all around you, and we could hear them as they were firing at the helicopter. But we got out safe, and I got to a triage unit about a half an hour later. And at that point, they told me I, I was too badly wounded. I would not be rejoining my friends, that I was going to uh, go to Tons uh, Benoit, where the 1st Division had a, an Army hospital right outside Saigon. And they took you there within 24 hours? I was at the triage unit for about an hour uh, where they separate the seriously wounded from the not so seriously. If you just have a flesh wound, they kept you at the triage unit and sent you back the next day or a couple days later. The seriously wounded were then put on another chopper to take them to the hospital. I was on an operating room table within two hours of being wounded at, at uh, Benoit, the hospital at Benoit. Uh, and. Uh, it was remarkable that, uh, you know, that the, the medical care that our men and women get today is phenomenal. I mean, you're, you're wounded in the Mideast and you're in Germany a couple hours later in surgery. Well, I was outside Saigon a couple hours after my, my, my wound and um, uh, I had four operations and I, I had the first one that, that same night. My right shoulder was totally destroyed. I have no right shoulder joint, but I still have the use of my right arm. So I'm very, very fortunate. And I, I had no wounds on my face either, other than I've lost the hearing in my right ear because the blast was so loud that over time uh, the hearing has gone away. But uh, I'm, I was very fortunate. Mm -hmm. I was in uh, the hospital uh, at Benoit. I'm sorry, not Benoit. Uh, I was at the hospital at Long Bin for a week. I had a second operation there. I was in a body cast from my waist up to my neck. Um, and my right arm was, was inside the cast with my hand sticking out the front of the cast um, to keep, the, to keep the, the shoulder in place. And a week later, they sent me to Yokohama, Japan, and I was in an army hospital in Japan for the month of November. Had a third operation there. In, in, um, in Japan, they told me that uh, I would be not going back. I would be discharged from the army after I took care of, took care of me. And I had a third operation. And then uh, after, in December, I was sent to Valley Forge Hospital outside Philadelphia, Valley Forge, Pennsylvania. And I was in the hospital there from December through, uh, through August of 1968. Had a fourth operation in March, and that's where they decided not to put in a shoulder prosthesis. The, the prosthesis in 1968 were still experimental, mm -hmm. so they told me they were just going to sew, sew my three bones together, scapula, clavicle, and my humerus bone. I had no ball joint left. And so I don't have any movement in my right shoulder. It's frozen, but it's sustainable. I could still live a normal life. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was discharged in August of 1968. Um, I received a 40% disability and uh, went to school in September of 1968, a month later, after I was discharged. Um, 
I wonder if you could educate us about the, the two different armies that you were fighting. Uh, I think you mentioned the Viet Cong and the North Vietnamese Army. Yes. Um, what's, what's the difference? Uh, the difference is uh, one is under the control of North Vietnam. The other was an organized Viet Cong force. Uh, the uniforms were totally different. Uh, the, the, the uniforms that we saw, the 173rd Viet Cong Regiment had khaki uniforms. They still had helmets. The North Vietnamese Army had dark, had dark green uniforms. Um, they were in joint uh, operation against us at Lac Ninh. Um, they were heavily armed. The day before, a couple of days before I was wounded, um, there was another firefight that I didn't mention before where we had to take a hill that they had bunkers set up on. Is that Hill 203? Yes. Okay. I, I can't remember the name, but um, that was the hill that we had to take bef the, before the, the ground, the night attack. And that battle lasted all afternoon, and there were, we counted 88 dead uh, Viet Cong uh, on that battle, and that was not the NVA on that battle, that was the uh, regimented unit. And um, we got to see these dead sol soldiers up close. We saw their uniforms, we saw their weapons, and that's where we found just tons of these RPG rockets all over the place when we got to the top of the hill after the battle. So that's why we knew that as opposed to being up against an unorganized or disorganized Viet Cong unit, these, this, this was a, an organized army and they were heavily armed. And uh, there were three other 1st Infantry Division battalions in that area. And uh, when they airlifted us in, um, they put us right on the border and the North Vietnamese and the Viet Cong tried to retreat into Cambodia and we were there as a blocking force to keep them from going back and that was what the Battle of Loch Ninh was all about. Mm -hmm. I read afterward and I, it's, it's in my book uh, and we learned this from the Colonel, Colonel Cavazos, that uh, over a thousand enemy soldiers were killed in the Battle of Loch Ninh. Uh, not just by our battalion but by all four battalions. It was a huge loss for the North Vietnamese and the Viet Cong, but their tactic became clear a couple of months later. Uh, they were trying to create a diversion force away from Saigon. From the Operation Tet? From Operation Tet. Yeah. And it was a, from a military standpoint, it was a, it was a very, very well thought out plan. They sucked a lot of the soldiers up to the Cambodian border and then unleashed this, this relentless attack in Saigon a couple of months later. So it, it, all this became very clear after that. The, the colonel that I mentioned earlier, Richard Cavazos, our battalion commander, was on the ground with us when we took that hill. He was on the ground with us at Loch Ninh. Uh, we learned a lot of this information from him at our Delta Company reunions. Uh, he's 88 years old now. Uh, colonel Cavazos was promoted eventually to a four-star general. He was the first Hispanic four-star general in the United States Army. Um, we were his boys, and uh, we've remained friends over these years to this day. Speaking of uh, a Spanish uh, commanding officer, did you have many African-American soldiers with you in the 1st uh, yes. Infantry? Yes, we did. Um, in my uh, platoon, I can't speak for the rest of the company, there were only, uh, out of about 40 or 50 men, there were only three U.S. Everybody else was RA. U.S. means that you were an enlistee, your, your, your army, your enlistee number. If you were RA, you were regular army, mm -hmm. which means, um, you, no, I'm sorry, U.S., you were drafted. drafted. RA, you right. were regular army. Right. You, you asked for this. Right. Um, out, of that, out of the platoon, I'd say probably um, it was about 50% African-American. Uh, I'd venture to say about 10 to 15 percent Hispanic, uh, but that, that's one of the uh, fallacies that you hear about the Vietnam War, that only the poor, only the black fought in Vietnam. Totally untrue. Right. Totally untrue. The draft was, was non-discriminatory, and in my unit I'd say that it was about 50-50 black and white. Um, it's uh, incredible friends that I still have friendship with. Uh, there was one young man in my 
in my squad, Jack Frepon, who came back from Vietnam and um, we visited when he was on leave, but he, en he enlisted to go back to Vietnam. He was a three-year RA like I was, and he was from Cincinnati. And at that point, uh, when he got back from Vietnam, he had been in the Army a year and a half. If you agreed to go back to Vietnam for another six-month tour, they would let you out of the Army early. So you could cut six months to a year off your enlistment. He agreed to go back to Vietnam to, to, uh, for a second tour, and he was killed in his second tour. He's buried at Gate of Heaven Cemetery in Montgomery. And uh, when he was killed in 1969, February 69, uh, he received the Distinguished Service Cross, which is the second highest medal, only second to the Medal of Honor. Yes. So I lost a lot of good friends in my company, but those of us still here today uh, uh, are best friends. They're spread out all over the country. My lieutenant lives in San Diego. Um, the medic who saved my life, Frank Passantino, lived in New York and visited several reunions. We have lots of pictures together. And he died of a heart attack last September. And um, I was going through, uh, I was sick last year. I had uh, pancreatic cancer and I was going through chemotherapy. And his wife delayed his funeral three days because the last day of my treatment, uh, I flew, I, my wife and I flew to New York to attend his funeral. So, so I could be there. It was nice of her to do that so I could be there. And there were two other of our friends from Delta Company that were there for the funeral as well. Wow. So that is another difference that made the transition from the Army to civilian life easier for me because I knew guys who would be my friends for life. Yeah. <clears throat> I don't know if you want to discuss it, but I read in your memoir about the uh, religious sort of a religious experience you had. I don't mind talking about it. Uh, I originally wrote the, my memoir when I was in Valley Forge, Pennsylvania recuperating in 1968 and um, I didn't include this what I'm going to tell you. I didn't include that in the first edition of my memoir. I never published my memoirs when I first wrote them. I typed them and put them on a desk and they sat there for 40 years. Um, but since I've had so many reunions with my fellow soldiers, I rewrote my memoir, basically contained it from the early days, and I included the years and the events from after the Vietnam experience. So I could include the good story about our reunions. And I decided to include the story about the night I was wounded, the religious experience I had. Uh, I'm a religious person, but I'm not overly zealous about my religion. I'm a Methodist, but I hope that I hope that means I'm religious, of course, but the night I was wounded, uh, let me back up, two months before, in September of 1967, uh, my, my girlfriend's father died, of a, uh, fell off a ladder, broke his hip, threw a blood clot, fought and died. I had only met him a couple of times before I left, so this was not somebody I really knew very well. But he died while I was over in Vietnam in September. I was wounded on November 1st, two months later, and as I'm sitting there after Passantino patched me up, between that time and when I was taken over to the, uh, to the, to the clearing to be evacuated, I was looking up at the rubber trees while the battle was still raging, explosions going off. I could see the tracer bullets ricocheting off the trees. I really thought I was going to die that night because I, I lost f half of my blood. And had I stayed there until dawn, I would have died. I would have bled to death. That's why the medic, Passantino, and the colonel, Cavazos, saved my life. They got me out of there and got me treatment. But I was, as I was lying there bleeding to death, I looked up into the trees and I saw a face. And it was the face of my girlfriend's father, who I had... I knew him, but I didn't know him very well. And I heard this face say to me, you're going to be all right. And then it vanished. And somehow, when you have an experience like that, mm. when it, uh, this was an angel visiting me, a calm takes over. And I, I, I didn't have a fear in the world. And shortly after that, Paige and Pasatino were there to take me to the clearing, and I was out of there. Mm -hmm. And I decided to include that in, my, in the book that I wrote, uh, my, my memoir, because I think it's helpful for other people. And I'm sure other soldiers in danger, other civilians who go through a similar experience, 
a life-threatening experience, have a, have a visit from an angel. And I felt it was worth sharing. I, I do too. I, you know, enjoyed, mystified mm -hmm. by those experiences that some people have. Um, so, you were given 40% disability and discharge, I take it, in 1968. 68. August of 68, if I remember correctly. So, uh, what did you do with your life at that point? I went back to the University of Cincinnati right away. Um, I, I just was a liberal arts major for a year, so I didn't know what I wanted to do. I eventually got a degree in German literature, and I got a master's degree in German literature. But I went back to school in September of 68. My wife and I got engaged. My girlfriend and I got engaged. And we got married a year later in 1969. Um, however, the experience that I had in 1968, going back to school, was very, um, very hard for me. Um, Unlike two years earlier, when the war really wasn't in the public mind, in 1968, uh, the campuses across the country exploded with anti-war protests. And um, it's been well discussed and documented, the treatment that Vietnam, Vietnam veterans received when they came home. I had a family that welcomed me. I had a girlfriend that welcomed me. My, my coming home was very comfortable, and I had a loving family. But my exposure on campus being a student was horrific. Um, the only tangible, tangible thing that somebody has to pr protest against the war was the Vietnam veteran. And my friends treated me well, but strangers that knew I was a Vietnam veteran were very harsh. I wore, I had a souvenir jungle jacket that I brought back with me from Vietnam. And I wore it proudly with the big red one patch on the right shoulder, mm -hmm. um, proudly to school on my first week of school. And here I am, 21 years old, and uh, I was verbally attacked, I was verbally abused, I was yelled at. Um, all those sayings that you hear Vietnam veterans, how they're treated, happened to me in the fall of 1968. Um, I, I decided to, I mean, I stayed in school and I was okay. Um, but I, I never wore my jungle fatigue jacket on campus ever again. And um, it took its toll. My wife and I got married in 1969, but I went through a delayed uh, reaction to not only maybe the war, but also the coming home. I, I suffered from PTSD uh, for about four to five years in the mid-70s. We were married. We didn't have children. And uh, What was I, the date of your marriage? Uh, we got married uh, September 13th, 1969. Right. And now we're into the early 70s. I was working at UC after I graduated. My wife was a nurse. We had no children's, children. We were living in a one-bedroom apartment. We didn't have a lot of money. Uh, but I went through a very bad time where um, uh, I couldn't understand why I was depressed. Uh, I uh, really... Uh, drank a lot of alcohol, didn't do drugs, but it got to the point where my wife and I got divorced. Um, I, it was my fault because I was just, I wanted to be alone. And we were, we were separated for a year and then we got divorced for a year. And um, PTSD was not a recognizable uh, ailment at that point in the mm -hmm. early 70s. I didn't know why I was depressed. Um, I personally paid and visited three different psych psychiatrists, and my wife went with me on the first one, and then I hired two more. They reviewed my record, they knew everything about Vietnam, and they could say, we can't find out, we can't give you any reason why you're depressed. PTSD was still, you know, something that wasn't really uh, a recognizable ailment. So I just felt, well, maybe I'm just crazy. I, I didn't know. And uh, eventually, after we were divorced, uh, it took me a year, but I put my life back together. Uh, sat in front of a mirror in my apartment and just talked to myself, saying, you're going to get over this. Looking back years later, we, we all know what I went through. And even though I didn't get treatment, apparently my case wasn't serious enough where I didn't go over the edge. My wife and I got remarried in 1976. Uh, on August 14th, 1976, or not, I'm sorry, August 14th, 1978, 
I uh, hope she doesn't watch this. I, I screwed up. As I said, we've been married um, 48 years, and we count our anniversary from the first year we got married, but we celebrated on the second date, which is August 14th. Um, I made th three promises to her when we got remarried that I was, that, that I'm, I'm well now, I'm going to get a real job, we're going to buy a house, and we're going to start a family. And within two years, we had all three accomplished. So my life was put back together. Unfortunately, a lot of other veterans, some of whom I know very well, um, have never recovered from the war. Right. And as I said earlier, uh, now that PTSD is recognizable uh, and is being treated, and compensated for, for the men and women returning from Iraq and Afghanistan, um, I've said to my friends, and most of my Vietnam buddies agree with me, we paid the price because the treatment wasn't there for us. But because of the bad treatment that the Vietnam veterans received, perhaps that compelled the country to take care of its veterans returning from war. And if we paid that price, so that's, that's happening today, it's a, it's a price well paid. And I'm thrilled that the men and women coming back are being treated as heroes and that if they do have mental scars from the war as well as physical, that that's being treated as well. And I'm very happy to see that. Uh, you said you, I think you said earlier that your wife was a nurse. Yes. Uh, what did she work at? In Cincinnati? And she spent um, her, most of her career as a critical care nurse at the University Hospital in the uh, uh, people who suffered from heart attacks and heart ailments. Mm -hmm. But her second career, up until the time she retired, she was a hospice nurse. And she practiced at the Hospice of Cincinnati in Blue Ash. Right. And she worked there until she retired about five years ago. And you mentioned children. Uh, you know, I have two grown children, uh, Emily, who's 37, and Evan, who's 35. They both live here in Cincinnati. And we have three grandchildren, and we see our grandchildren every Tuesday and Thursday. We babysit for them. Uh, I am b blessed beyond description that I have both my kids and uh, my grandkids here in Cincinnati. And I retired seven years ago, and um, my life is driven now with taking care of the grandkids. That's wonderful. We see them every week, and that's. Uh, that's I wanted to talk story. to you about your, your employment, too, so we touched that. You said that you worked at UC for a while. What did you do there? I worked at UC for five years in the Student Affairs Division. Um, uh, in 19, uh, 1970, I started at UC in 1973, um, and um, that, that the University of Cincinnati was the first campus to have a McDonald's on campus. And so my first job was to try to get fast foods to come onto campus and, and, and develop a contract where they would give, pay the campus to be there. Then I moved into doing the rock concerts and the student program board. <clears throat> Not a job with a good future. Right. I did that for five years, and during those five years, 73 to 78 is when I had my problems. Um, after we got remarried, I, one of the promises I made was I would get a real job. Right. I started working for WCPO-TV in 1978, and I retired from WCPO-TV at the end of 2010, after 32 years, and uh, worked at, with, for Scripps Broadcasting and WCPO for three decades, half my life. Mm -hmm. And it's a good company based right here in Cincinnati, yes. and uh, I was very fortunate uh, to have such a good company to work for. My last job there was general manager of WCPO-TV, and I, I was there as ge general manager for 12 years, uh, uh, and that was my last job. Uh, I still watch Channel 9 every day. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Uh, at this point, I usually uh, ask Brian, uh, when he runs the camera, uh, if he has any questions. Yeah, a couple questions. Why did you decide to join the Army and not save the Marines? Why the Army? That's a very good question, and um, the way I, I, I've been asked that question on several occasions, and the way I've answered it in the past is, I may have been crazy to leave college and enlist in the Army, but I wasn't crazy enough to list, enlist in the Marines. Um, yeah, I, it was just something, my dad was in the Navy during World War II, and I just felt, you know, I grew up playing with Army men, and I just, 
I just felt the Army was where I wanted to be and not the Marines. Uh, I, I'm sure I thought about it. I don't know why. I knew I wanted to be in Vietnam and I knew I wanted to carry a rifle. So uh, I felt the Army was the quickest way to get there. We've been talking to a couple of Vietnam veterans and they've talked, to, they've talked about different things about the M16. Did you have a good or bad experience with the M16? What was your, what was your thoughts on it? The M16 in the, uh, in the late 60s was still a fairly new weapon. Um, I did not have any uh, extraordinarily bad problem with the M16, but it had a tendency to jam. If it got wet, if you got sand in the barrel, it would jam and you would have to take it apart. It, it comes apart very easily and you could take the M16 apart and put it back together in two minutes. Um, but the first night that we were in combat at Shenandoah, when we were, it was a pouring night rain, we were standing in knee-deep water, my M16 jammed. I had to tell Fiera, who was in the foxhole with me, I got to pull back, and I had to take the rifle apart and put it back together. So yes, uh, they improved it uh, throughout the Vietnam War, but um, the, AK, the, the counterpart to the M16 on the enemy side was the AK-47, which is a Chinese-made weapon. And um, the Chinese, the AK-47 would never jam. You could put anything on that weapon, it would still fire. However, it was not as accurate as the M16. So we had an advantage of a rifle we had some problems with, but you could pick a target at 300 yards and, and, and nail it. Uh, the the AK-47 just was sporadic. Um, I meant to ask this a little bit earlier, but, uh, how, you seem like you were somewhat aware of what was going on in Vietnam as opposed to some of your friends. I mean, how, most people we talked to, it seemed like it, it wasn't that, people weren't that aware of it, uh, like 64, 65. I mean, what you were keeping, you were following it? I was. Um, I think part of it was I, was I was not happy in school, that I wanted to do something. I knew if I, if I, if I just quit college and did nothing, I would be drafted right away because back then you could still have a deferment for uh, being a college student. But I just was reading the, the papers and I just, I re remember clearly Time Magazine came out with a picture and it showed an infantry platoon in a, in a firefight with the enemy. I cut out that picture and I put it on my desk in my room and it just sort of, I just sort of fixated on that picture and I would talk about Vietnam with my fraternity brothers and my friends and they'd all just look at me with glass eyes saying, well, what's, why, are you, why are you interested in that? And uh, it just sort of made me angry that nobody was paying attention to the sacrifices that we were making on an increasing basis in Vietnam. And in that period, in the fall of 1966, I just decided I want to be there. I knew it was going to be, the, the war was going to be the event of our generation, and it was. The baby boomer generation was defined by the Vietnam War in many respects, and I knew I wanted to be part of that. I just, I just felt I had to be there. Um, I was wondering, do you remember what your, what your first day in Vietnam was like, your memories of when you first arrived? Yes, it was very, um, uh, very vivid in my memory. We got to the port of Vong Tau, right outside Saigon, late in the afternoon on such and such a date in July. And we thought we were going to get off the ship right away. They kept us on the ship overnight because uh, by 4 o'clock we were going to have to take a truck convoy to Xeon, about a two or three hour ride, and they said, we can't travel at night. So you guys are staying on the boat all night, the first night. That night we heard um, I guess there were depth charges, but there were explosions going off all around the boat. Uh, the, the army was detonating these explosions to keep sappers away from putting a mine against the boat. So we were greeted our first night staying on the boat to these explosions going off all night. At dawn the next day, we got off the boat, we, had our, we got our weapon and our rucksack, our duffel bag, and we got off the boat and there was a South Vietnamese army band uh, South of me, it could have been a U.S. Army band, I can't remember. They were playing army music as we were disembarking from the boat. And here we are in Vietnam with an army band and I just felt this is, this is really surreal that we're going to be in a war zone with, with an army band greeting us. And then we took about a two or three hour convoy to Xeon 
And I remember looking how, I, I just remember feeling how hot it was. Vietnam was extremely hot and extremely humid. This was the wet season. And, but the countryside was just lush and beautiful. That's it was remarkable how beautiful the countryside was when I first got there that first day. Did you have much encounter with, with the natives, I guess? None, none whatsoever. Um, we, had I been there longer, had I had some time off, I was only in country four months before I was wounded. Um, I never had any uh, exposure to the South Vietnamese people other than the people working at the base camp at Zeon. Uh, the, the people would sweep the floors, clean, clean the, the places. They were all South Vietnamese and we learned some pidgin Vietnamese from them. Um, but I never had any exposure to them, no. Yeah, I was going to ask, did you learn many phrases when you were there? No, no. I learned uh, how to say uh, Dee Dee Mao, which means get, a, get out of here. Uh, I learned some other phrases to say hello, um, but I, I wasn't exposed to the, to the civilians or the, the native, native South Vietnamese much at all. Did they have much, uh, I know you weren't there as long as you, know, as you, as you were going to be, but did, you, did they have much as far as like a USO show or any kind no. of campaign? They did have USO. Bob Hope was making visits to Vietnam in 1967, um, but I was not there long enough to visit a USO show or to have R&R. &R. Um, after, after six months, you're given a week off and you can go anywhere you want, where, which is any, anywhere in Southeast Asia. About as far as you could go would be Hawaii, and that was reserved for officers who were married where their wife could come and join them. But I wasn't in country long enough for R&R, &R, and I never saw a USO show. Uh, I would like to say this about the USO though. Those of us living in Cincinnati are blessed to have uh, uh, a very active USO chapter. They're all volunteers, there's no paid staff, but the USO has a, uh, a benefit every year and more money is raised in Cincinnati for Walter, Walter Reed Army Hospital than any other city in the country. The USO, it's led by a, a, a wonderful gentleman named Steve Lee, who, who, uh, who is a, a, a local banker, philanthropist, and he conducts, the, conducts this, uh, or organizes this yearly tribute. It's gonna be on, uh, at, at the boathouse on Sunday of fireworks weekend. But there's a very active USO chapter here, and they do God's work. Uh, they raise so much money for, all the money goes to Walter Reed. And it doesn't just go to the, to the soldiers. It goes to the families who come there and stay there to visit with their, to visit with their son or daughter or husband or wife. Um, they do a lot of work, a lot of good work. When you got sent to, when you got wounded, you got sent to triage, when you got, what was that? Was that like a mass unit or something? Yes, yeah. that's, it, that's how exactly. How primitive was it? It was, it was very primitive, just tense. Um, if you needed surgery, you would not have surgery there. It was simply to, 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 to separate the seriously wounded from the not so serious. They had beds there, and if you were not seriously wounded, you'd stay there in a bed. No surgery. I needed surgery right away. I was losing blood rapidly, and that's why they took me down to Long Bend. What was your helicopter ride when you were wounded? I mean, I mean, how, I mean were you slipping in and out of consciousness or anything? Or you I was conscious the whole time. Uh, they were firing at us at Loch Ninn until we got to the, wherever the triage unit was. Then when they, when they put me on a helicopter to go to Long Bin, uh, I was actually sitting in a seat um, and I was awake the whole time, although uh, when I got to Long Bin, got to the hospital, had a series of tests and I actually passed out prior to my surgery. Woke up in the operating room prior to the surgery. I, I was totally naked and there was a, an army nurse the first American I had seen in four months, bending over me, patting my head with a wet face cloth. And um, I had a St. Christopher medal on that Sally had given me, and the back of it was engraved, Lovingly Sally. And since the surgery was on my right shoulder, the Army made a policy of never removing a St. Christopher medal if, from a soldier. She taped it to my left shoulder, and she looked at it and she said, well, who's Sally? And I say in my book that I almost said that Sally was my mother. But I didn't. I said, Sally's my girlfriend. This woman was beautiful. And um, I was out after that and woke up the next day in a cast. How long did you have to wear that cast? I had to wear the cast until uh, I came home in December. So it was only a month. 
but I had three operations and they take the cast off and then they put a new cast on after all three operations. And when I came home from Japan in December, we landed at Fort Dix and I was uh, processed to go to Valley Forge. I got to Valley Forge and they took the cast off there. Did you have to do a lot of physical therapy? Yes, my right arm had atrophied totally. Um, I couldn't, my arm was frozen. Uh, I couldn't move it. And so I had to do therapy to get, every day they gradually work the arm better. What kind of stuff were they making you do? Just all exercises. They, even my, my joint was fused and they, they did a fourth operation at Valley Forge to fuse it again. But they wanted me to move my upper arm around. And when my joint moves, it moves like this. All bone, the bones are fused together. So I have very limited motion in my upper arm, but they wanted me to run, do it in circles so that it would not atrophy, so I could at least have, I have 40% range of motion, and that's why I'm a 40% disability. Is your right arm your, your righting arm? Yeah. So did uh, you sort of become more left-handed? Did you train yourself to do more stuff with your left hand? I have the full use of my lower arm and my hand, full use, and I am right-handed. So I only use my right arm to write with. That's the only thing I use it for. I brush my teeth, comb my hair, I shave, I lift things, everything is with my left arm. I've had to learn to do that. How, but how, how long did that take? <coughs> Start getting, I'm sure Not long. Like natural now. It's, it, it, was, it was totally natural. Because back then my arm was frozen. I had to exactly. start learning to shave with my left arm. And, um, but again, I want to, uh, to stress that how fortunate I was. My, my wound could have been a lot worse. The treatment that the wounded soldiers got in Vietnam was m miraculous. I mean, it seems very antique now by today's standards, but it was state-of-the-art back then. I was off the battlefield and on, on an operating table a couple hours after I was wounded. It was, it was absolutely amazing. And again, I say two people, two men, are responsible for me being here today. Frank Passantino, my medic, and General Cavazos, um, uh, who lives in San Antonio. And uh, I, I tell him all the time that he's that he saved my life, and he's a very shy person. Uh, but as you see in one of the letters, I included one of his letters to me uh, in the book, and, and he, is, he is not averse at all to saying, I love you. I mean, he just is a very, he, he loves his soldiers. Wonderful man. Now, uh, I think, and I'd be wrong, you let me know if I'm wrong about this, but weren't you involved with getting the Vietnam Memorial in Eden Park here in Cincinnati? Can Yes. Sure. In the early 80s, uh, a friend of mine, Earl Correll, um, who's, who's a Vietnam vet as well, uh, we, we became friends. I joined um, the VVA, Vietnam Veterans of America, Chapter 10, and I don't really attend a lot of VVA meetings anymore, but I got to know Earl through the VVA chapter, and he had the idea of creating a Vietnam Veterans Memorial. This was 1982 when we started talking about it. And uh, I, I was working at WCPO as a salesman at the time and I agreed to help him build this memorial. Uh, we found a gentleman named Kirkadoukalis, who's a Greek gentleman who is a, who is a bronzed sculptor. Uh, he's the one who, his company takes care of the Taylor Div Davidson Fountain on Fountain Square. He agreed to uh, build this bronze statue of these three men. We had a design. We had a designer who, des who had a clay sculpture of these three, uh, I'm sorry, of the two men um, of, of who were in the, high, in the Eden Park Memorial. And we, did, we needed uh, a 70, an $85,000 budget. The statue was going to cost $75,000. And we went to the park board, and they agreed to put it in Eden Park. But they told us we needed to have a $10,000 endowment fund on top of that so that they, they could maintain it. So in 1982, Earl and I set out on the course of calling on local business leaders and philanthropists to raise this $85,000. You would think it would be an easy ask. We had so many doors slammed in our face, it was pitiful. Um, from business leaders saying, I'm not about to put my name behind a Vietnam Veterans Memorial which shows just 10 years later, and this was just uh, 
uh, about seven or eight years after the U.S. involvement ended, there was still a prejudice against the Vietnam War and the Vietnam veteran. We worked for two years to raise $85,000. And the only reason it's there today is because there is a, a benefactor here in town and he wants to remain anonymous and he's since passed on. But he wrote us a check for $10,000 and that put us over the top. And uh, we had enough money to <clears throat> build a memorial and it was dedicated in April of 1984. At that point, it was the only Vietnam veterans memorial outside of Washington, D.C. And um, it, as you know, if you go to see the Vietnam Veterans Memorial in Washington, there is now a bronze statue in front of that memorial as well with three bronze soldiers looking out towards the wall. And I don't know, but I have a strong inkling that the designer of that bronze statue copied it from our little statue in Eden Park. No, uh, being an infantryman didn't give me any skills. It certainly, and my experience, certainly gave me a deep um, commitment to uh, life and to live each life to its fullest. Um, the, the experience I went through almost dying on a battlefield makes me appreciate life so much more. I had that four or five year bad period, which I think was the adjustment to come to that realization. Um, and. Um, the friendships that I've, that I've developed, I would not trade. These are friends of mine for life. We have something very much in common that we spent a few months with each other in a combat zone halfway around the world and we are brothers for life. The term band of brothers truly is, is descriptive of what you go through when you are in combat. And it's true for any branch of the service. Uh, it's true for any war. There is, a, there is a bond between uh, men and women who have a, 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 an experience like that. Um, and when I started looking for a job in 1973, um, after my wife graduated and, uh, from college and we, we got married four years earlier, um, there were times when I didn't put my Vietnam experience on my resume just because of the, what I mentioned to you about trying to raise money for the Vietnam Veterans Memorial. Um, I'm kind of ashamed of that now, but that was just the way things were. You didn't want to be, you didn't want to tell people you were a Vietnam veteran. Just think of the movies that were coming out in the 1970s and 1980s. Coming Home with Jane Fonda and John Voight. You had to be crazy. If you were a Vietnam vet, you were crazy. The Deer Hunter. If you were a Vietnam vet, you, you had the suicidal complex to play Russian roulette. Um, even the movie Platoon, which was produced by Oliver Stone, who was, who was a Marine in Vietnam, stereotyped the Vietnam veteran as a baby killer, a raper, uh, a, a drug addict. Um, the, the stereotypes in the 70s and 80s were rampant, and so you were forced to try not, not to talk about that experience. Uh, this will be my last question. When do you think that changed? When do you think, uh, do you feel like it has changed? It didn't change. For the Vietnam veterans, um, I believe, and I'm not a historian, but it, 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 it really changed in uh, 1980 when the Iranian hostages were released. And if you remember, that, they, were, they were there for a year. They were released in 1980, right, right when Ronald Reagan was elected president. And this country went berserk, honoring them and praising them and congratulating them. And, uh, figuratively speaking, every Vietnam veteran looked at that reception and shook their head and said, this is crazy. What we did and the treatment we got coming home, and now you see this. I think uh, from a public standpoint, people started discussing the dichotomy, the total disconnect between the Iranian hostages and the Vietnam veteran, and started saying, recognizing in hindsight we did not treat our returning soldiers from Vietnam very well. And that's why I said earlier that uh, as we got more involved in foreign conflicts, especially in Iraq, um, I am so glad that this country has matured to the point where these are, that they recognize these are soldiers returning 
they're serving our country, we're going to honor them. And I'll say this about the difference between the soldiers today and the, sol the Vietnam veteran. Um, they may be, they may have a lot more modern equipment, they may um, still be fighting uh, and risking their lives, but these are soldiers, because there's no draft, these are soldiers who go back a second, a third, a fourth, a fifth time to serve in that war zone. The men and women serving in the Mideast today are they, are, they are sacrificing more than the Vietnam veteran who had, a, who had 365 days in the country. So you can't, there are similarities and dissimilarities dissimil between today's veteran and the Vietnam veteran. Well, I think that's all my questions. Yeah. Well, there's, I always end this, and I mean it sincerely, um, and I know it becomes just a, a statement people say, but I thank you for your service to our country, and I'm honored that you allowed this interview to be conducted, and thank you so much. Thank you very much. It's, it's an honor to be connected with, the, with this project. I appreciate it very much. Thank you, Ray. Thank you. Thank you, Brian.